Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K.L. I'm the host of this podcast, I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, botanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand in watercolor, identity, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And welcome to the Artist Friends Podcast. This is Clive J. Kale, and you're listening to episode 73 for November the 30th, 2020, our last episode for the month of November. And I'm here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Okay. This week, in this episode, we're going to talk about the making of and the mystery of the movie about Vincent Van Gogh, the uh, loving Vincent, which was the movie that was 100% the animated, animated 100% each single single frame was hand painted by an artist. And that was what was uh, spectacular. Now, I had a link. If you go to uh, www.talkartpodcast.com, that's talkartpodcast.com, there's the links for the uh, some uh, secondary videos we're going to talk about. And I got lucky, and the entire movie was on YouTube at the time I posted that. It's now been taken down. So, unfortunately, you can't. For our listeners, you won't be able to watch the movie, but uh, if you get an opportunity, I really, if you love art, you would really enjoy watching the movie. It's about an hour and 34 minutes long, the animated movie of Loving Vincent. It is spectacular. It's available on uh, YouTube if you want to pay. You can pay. I think it's you, know, you can rent the movie, you know, and, and watch it on YouTube. So it's available there for that. And I think it's on, it's probably on Amazon and and. I'm not sure. It might even be on Netflix. You know, so, um, you know, I highly recommend you check it out. Now, when I first watched this movie, there was a theory that was presented in the movie I had never heard of before that quite possibly Vincent Van Gogh was murdered, that he didn't commit suicide. Now, the story for hundreds of years has been he shot himself in the stomach in an attempt to suicide attempt. However, the proposition that they proposed in the movie uh, was that he was uh, possibly murdered by somebody else, either intentional or possibly accidentally. I had never heard of that, so that's what fascinated me. So I did some research and everything. In a couple of the links, there is a really excellent, uh, they did a, a short 12-minute link from um, 60 Minutes, 
because uh, I guess in the 2015 or 2016, there was a Van Gogh uh, exhibition traveling of his paintings traveling throughout the United States. So 60 Minutes did a little special thing. And these, these gentlemen were researching the theory that Vincent Van Gogh had been murdered. And the information they present is so compelling and so plausible. I mean, after you watch that, I think you, you might come to the same conclusion. Diane, what about you? Did, did you yeah, I, from what the, the evidence or whatever that they uncovered and how they were um, checking out how far it would have been from where they said he had shot himself to the village. And, you know, I, it, it, that's probably not what happened. <laughs> it probably happened in that garden there that they said in town where yeah. the... Um, that was like only a half a mile away. I mean, yeah, that's somewhere with the, with the original theory. Yeah. You know, it was like three, three miles away. He would have had to walk three miles away with his stomach bleeding in his stomach to get back to the hotel where he was staying. Plus yeah. climb over a, a, it was rough uh, terrain. Yeah. You know, that's what they said. In, a, in a garden wall and everything versus the new theory that they've come up where he was shot in that uh, courtyard that was only a half a mile away down the street would make more plausible sense. He could have mm -hmm. got down. And what, uh, of course, see, everybody has said that there was no gun. Where was the gun? There was no gun found. No, you know, how, where did he get the gun from? You know, and, and so the, uh, the, the original story was all – Pretty much, they got the original story from the proprietors of the hotel. They were the ones who propagated the story that uh, he had uh, uh, committed suicide. But with that investigation, when they went back, this gentleman who did that research, there was a lot more other people that didn't get talked. Yeah. About. Yeah. Yeah, and they also said that the the angle of the. Um the way the bullet had gone into his body, it would have been impossible for him to have done that to himself. Yeah. yeah. They said there was uh, some children that, or young teens or whatever, that used to really torment him and aggravate him every day. It was like, the, it was in the summertime and in that um, they would follow him out to where he liked to go paint and just, you know, just tormenting, you know, so... Yeah, that uh, you know, thinking that maybe those guys were responsible, but he just didn't want them to be accused or, want yeah. to be accused of it. Mark, he was in a, he was in a bit of a wretched state, you know. He was he was experiencing the symptoms of syphilis, you know, and so he. But at the same time, like in Loving Vincent, what I love the proposition is they actually uh, read uh, letters from his you know, his letters to his brother Theo. And letters they'd written to like the uh, the postmaster who was his good friend, you know. And I love when he had the conversation with his son of in, in the Loving Vincent part movie. He says, "Yes, he had problems. He went to the asylum, and when he got out of the asylum, he was cured. Because right here, he wrote a letter. He says, how can in the letter he says I am feeling." I am feeling cured and I am feeling the best I've ever been and eager to, to get back to work. And then six weeks later, he commits, his, he, he commits suicide. How yeah. can man change in six weeks? You know, I mean, it, well, I mean, if so, I can see where somebody could change in six weeks, if they were, if, you know, it doesn't take long for your stinking thinking to, to get the <laughs> hold of you. Six weeks is, it can happen, but I mean, it, it goes more to the, to, I think to those children who they said that were aggravating him on a daily basis during the summer that year. Um, and yeah. maybe he just didn't want to ruin their lives by accusing them of what they did. But to uh, begin to pronounce the name of the city, I think it's called Overs or something. Yeah, Over. Um, that that area was considered a basically like a playground for the rich. It was, you know, a lot of the wealthy people take their vacations there. So a lot of these kids came from wealthy families and they had money and uh, Vincent would, you know, would let them tease him because they would, they would pay for, pay his bar bill. You know, they'd pay for his drink you know, and everything. So that, uh, that kind of explains 
why even though they act they tormented him and they teased them and everything they uh you know he he still kind of hung around with them and that's what a lot of other people a lot of testimony a lot of people said they always saw him hanging hanging with those kids yeah and if he was drinking again he could have gotten depressed again because alcohol is a depressant i mean if you drink alcohol on a daily basis it it's actually a depressant i mean you're happy and in good mood when you're drinking but then when you wake up the next day you don't feel worth a darn you know <laughs> i don't think the people in europe they drank a lot you know and so you know a lot of people have problems with it and not what well, you know, i I just, the evidence was just so that was uh, it's so plausible. It is so plausible that uh, you know it would if it was presented in a court, it would hold up in court. I mean, these guys did some excellent research, and they, they, you know they went back and and uh, found all these other people, you know, who gave testimony, and they, you know, uh, but uh, that struck me with the movie. Other than you know. Obviously, I was extremely fascinated with the uh, the quality of the, the animation and everything. What did you think about the, uh, the video where they talk about the making? Yeah, you know, the making of it. Yeah, you know? yeah, that was pretty impressive. I, I mean, <laughs> to have done that because they were talking about how for every frame of the film they had to repaint the the paintings completely. In some cases, in a lot of cases, so. I forget how many the numbers were, how many paintings they ended up making throughout the whole painting, the whole movie. <clears throat> but I just can't. <laughs> and the number of artists that they had do it all so that it could get done. I mean, it still took them a long time to get it all done. I but think there was every 12th of a second they had to do a new frame and do a new painting. Change that painting, that painting every 12th of a second they had to change the positions and of the people that they were portraying in the painting. To well, I know it. when I was, yeah, I know when I was in college, I took an animation class and well, this is before computers, but so it was similar to what they were doing. They were doing everything by hand. They weren't using computers really too much, but um, we had to make a animation. I don't remember how long it was. It might've been like per minute. And I had hundreds of <laughs> drawings and it was just a drawing one, you know, yep. but because you have every little tiny movement, you have to draw another, you know, version of what you just drew. <laughs> so it shows, so when you flip through the, we were doing making flip books, and so when you flip yeah. the pages, it would, you know, the thing would move and do all the stuff. But my, my, I just can't imagine doing paintings like that many paintings to do that. Yeah. That the amount of work for that is just incredible. My hats off to the artist. They did, you know, and they had a hundred, a hundred and. The numbers always go up and down. One one interview will say 120. Another interview says 125. I think what happened was they probably had that 125, but then after a while, the artists got burnt out, and so yeah, I'm sure they did. I mean, that, that one woman they had on there, she said that after it was two and a half months or something, she was away from her family, <laughs> working constantly pretty much, and she had had yeah. enough and went. She went home. <laughs> hey, so I they can, probably went through a lot of artists. This, and this took them five years, you know, five years to. Yeah, that's a lot of work. You know, and, that's a long time to commit yourself to a project, too. You know, and uh -huh. it's, I mean, it's hard enough doing art that long, but then to do it in not your style, in someone else's style, it's, yeah. that's a lot. And it, it does. Um, you have to learn the Van Gogh style. Yeah, it does affect your own work, too, when mm -hmm. you're working in somebody else's style. So it's um I don't know you'd ha they'd have to I don't know how they interviewed the artists to to find the ones that they found to work on that project but yeah you they're, know I, I wonder what they what kind of criteria they used to interview them <laughs> like how to find you know, people that would do that one on one side of me yeah oh I would love to participate but then the other mm -hmm. side, Oh no! The work, yeah, the amount of yeah, work. you got to give up. How many, how many months that some of those artists stayed there before yep. they got a break from it? Well, I think one girl said eight months. You know that she had. They, they were working, working long, time. long days too. Mm -hmm. Ten and twelve hours a day. Mm -hmm. That's that'll drain you. <laughs> and they had uh, what three different studios? You know where they were at. 
located around around Europe, you know, and they were the main ones in Poland, and they could, I think they had a studio in Germany and you know, a studio in England, and <laughs> it's like, oh my God! They put them in little <laughs> cubicles to do the work with a screen and a in a you know thing for them to paint on. They would only show. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> Because, you know, they would do all the, you know, the live act. They would do the, you know, the, the filming with the actors, you know. And then they would just show, you know, just the, like you said, the 12 seconds. And they would have to create the paints for those, you know, for those 12 seconds. Yeah. Seconds of, of video. And I like where uh, they were interviewing one artist and said that, that you had to swallow your ego because you would, you would, work, you would have this beautiful painting. And then they would say, okay. You got to scrape, scrape it off, and redo it. <laughs> do it at this angle, you know. And had to keep. Yeah, yeah. Almost every twelfth of a second, they made a new painting for. I thought that was pretty. That's pretty in depth. I mean, to. Yes. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> and, and they said that each, well, each painting probably took them several hours, if not several days, to paint. Mm-hmm. And, and I would think it would be depending on whether started. they had to do the whole things. You know, if they were starting a new segment of the film, they would have to do a whole new painting and then move the characters through it. And that mm -hmm. would take less time. But still, it takes time, you know, to set up the whole painting for them to use. And it was, you know, so. besides doing this, it, it was also just putting it all together was a major technical achievement. You know, the way they, mm -hmm. put, you know. So the film itself is is a, a true is a true work of art. Just the film itself is a work of art. And you know the beautiful thing about this, what really touched me, it was all done for the love of Vincent. I mean, it was done because they loved Vincent Van Gogh. They wanted to do something to uh, honor him, and. Uh, there was there was no uh, thought of uh, you know winning awards or or making a lot of money, and in fact, <laughs> the, the movie the movie the labor of love you know the labor of love because uh, I like the the the, uh, the producer the uh, and director the director was uh, this the producer was it was a husband and wife team uh, he was English and she was uh, Polish and the story is is that um, she had been uh, uh, struggling as an artist. And uh, she read uh, one of, came across, you know, she admired, always, always admired Vincent Van Gogh and was reading one of his letters. And one of her letter, letters inspired her and changed her life so much that uh, she, uh, she wanted to give something back. So she was going to make since she, her husband was a, an Academy, Academy Award winning uh, director, he had made, a, I guess, a, an animated movie a couple years earlier and won an Academy Award for, for, and, for it. And um, um, he um, had approached him with the idea. But she was only going, you know, just a little short seven minutes. And he told her, he said, why not make this a full length movie production? So that's well, you saw you saw how many people were interested in it once she put the idea out there. But wasn't there something that he saw like a line of people waiting to to see her? Uh, what what inspired him was the in the uh, he was in England. And they oh, the letters. Had, yeah, they had all they had. They didn't have any of Van Gogh's painting. They just had Van Gogh's letters on display in the museum, and he saw a line of people around the block waiting in the freezing cold to get in to see those letters. And, uh, yeah. So he knew at that point that there was so much interest in what they were, that what she was planning on doing, that she should do a full length movie about it. So yeah, that was just by chance really. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so she just, you know, wanted to give back to him. And uh, then this project just grew and grew and they, they uh, uh, had a gold me. Uh, they started up a gold me fund or a fundraising thing uh, to uh, to gain people uh, to to get extra money to you know to, to pay the artists, you know. And they had gotten five million dollars financing. In fact, they, like, I think they said, the movie only costs 
like you know, but everything about like ten million dollars. You know, they had five million already for just production, but they needed some more money to pay the artists. And so they they did. They got they they fund they uh, crowdfunded the money and they got that and got the project going and everything. And um, I don't know how much money it's made since then. I I you know since it's been shown and, and it started out and just. Yeah. Being shown I didn't in, really give me any information about that. Yeah, it probably, it, you know, it, uh, they, uh, you know, being shown in, in first and just museums and art museums around the world, you know, premiering. And then it eventually got to in, into theaters. And the uh, the, the guy, the, the composer of the music, uh, he was actually nominated for an Academy Award. He, he didn't win, but at least it, it did get a couple Academy Award nominations, you know, for for animation and for, you know, for the music. But the beautiful thing about it is this was a work of art. The film itself is a work of art. And everything that went into it, you know, and, and uh, a couple of the they, they created new ways of working, too, that had never been used before. So, you know, they, had, they created all this new technology or whatever to be able to do it. Absolutely, because animation... To, to, Animation has been around now for a while, and there's a thing they call a rotoscope. You know, a lot of people say, well, no, it's rotoscope. And, in fact, the director I love when he was interviewing, being interviewed, you know, he said, um, we could have done it the more traditional way, but it wouldn't have the same feel. We wanted to have Vincent Van Gogh paintings coming alive. And, and, they, and then when they broke down the different scenes, that were uh, the background was that they were in Van Gogh, in in Van, in Van Gogh's paintings, of his different paintings, you know, which I thought, mm -hmm. yeah, know. they kind of put them all together, from different parts from different paintings together. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. And as and I cracked up when he said, actually he said we've set filmmaking back a hundred years because this is the worst way <laughs> to make a movie, <laughs> the hardest way to make a movie. <laughs> long, long, long way. Long way around. Long is the hardest way to make a movie. So anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, our listeners, please, if you get the opportunity, uh, love art. And if you love Vincent Van Gogh's art, uh, watch Loving Vincent. And uh, it'll, it'll bring tears <laughs> to you. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to wrap up this episode. You have been listening to the Artist Fence Podcast, episode uh, 73. And this is Clyde J. Kale. And I've, we've been talking with uh, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. And uh, anything, have we any announcements to make or anything? Or you're, you're <laughs> having a sale in my store. Oh, well. It ended today but i'm probably going to put things on sale again so um yeah as yeah, we get closer to the yeah i need to do it in the beginning of the month of december to uh, all my get people are coming in by you got sales going on you know and, and it was so you know it, that's what that's what it is you know with, you know with the holidays diane your exhibition is still going on right that's, yeah yeah that goes on till on the 19th of december last week uh, Diane and Constance talked to. We've been just kind of like, you know, they give me a little bit of input, but most of the time I just kind of scratch my head and say, okay, let's 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 pick this subject this week. We've got to <laughs> we're going to have a little bit of a schedule. We're going to have like one week we'll be talking about our craft and the actual uh, improving what we technique and studio practice. And then the next week, maybe some more art history, and then a week after that, maybe social media. And we're going to try to have a little more, a little more structure. So everything's open. Everything is open, open for discussion. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Anyhow, thank you so much for listening, folks. Thank you, Diane and Constance, and I hope you had a you had a nice Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I sure did, and. I'll say goodbye to Diane and Constance, and bye-bye, Diane. Bye, Clyde. Bye, Constance. Bye, everyone. Bye, Constance. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. Good night, folks, and thank you so much for listening.
The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at some mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.